So at 70 smithing, I was able to continue Dork's tasks, but it turns out I had other ones that I forgot to do. I didn't realize that, so we're going to go do those. They're simple enough. You just make some weapons, and then you bring them to a guy. But one of them required that we go to the Dwarven city of Keldegrim. Now, anyone who's familiar with Keldegrim knows that as soon as you enter Keldegrim, you end up knocking over a statue, and you're immediately thrust into doing the giant dwarf quest. As it happens... You don't have to do it immediately, you can just leave. Back in the early 2000s, in the aughts, when I first did this quest, I ended up in Keldegrim because I was exploring the game, and I thought I had to stay there and help because I was under arrest and everybody was mad at me. So I had to help rebuild the statue. The quest used to be a lot harder, because you had to collect ore from all around the game, and this was before the Grain Exchange existed. We'll come back to this quest later, though. We did what we had to do in Keldegrim, and we got some charges on our golf and an amulet. Now this was the task that required 70 smithing that I thought was the only one I had to do. And it's actually a really easy one. You just make some necronium great axes and you put them in a box, leave them at a drop point, and then a monkey comes to collect them. Obviously it's a ninja monkey, so it throws a banana at you. I wouldn't have it any other way. So with that finished up, we got the smithing XP and a bunch of charges on our Goffin and Amulet, and we returned to smithing the rest of our Orichalcum bars. Initially I was just planning on making a bunch of plate bodies and then selling them on the Grand Exchange, but I changed my mind and we're going to do... 10 sets of Orichalcum Burial Armor. Each set of Burial Armor at the end gives 17,000 experience, so that plus all the experience gained from making the plus 3 armor ends up being quite a significant amount of XP, at least at this level. Following our long stint at the Artisan's Workshop, this is what our stats are looking like. Our total level is exactly 1,500, and we were able to get 74 smithing from the 10 sets of Orichalcum Burial Armor paired with all the XP and bonus XP we got from doing those three dork tasks. Since it's February, we can do the oyster distraction and diversion again, but I have two clue scroll caskets that we're going to open before we open the oyster. Nice, we got a pith helmet. That's one fortunate component. I didn't know there were pith helmets in RuneScape. This is the first time I've ever seen one in game, but it doesn't matter. The easy clue, not so good. We re-roll it and still garbage. Let's open the oyster. Okay, let's try again next month. We're here at the Thieves Guild training thieving, what a surprise, by lockpicking these doors. This is pretty much the fastest thieving experience you can get until level 62 when you unlock safe cracking. It's kind of silly since you have to keep hopping worlds to get new doors to unlock, but I want to unlock the ability to crack saves across Gilinor. See what I did there? So we'll need to get to level 62 thieving. The problem is, I hate training thieving without safe cracking. Unlocking these doors may be the fastest way to level, but it's also a very boring way to level, especially because you have to keep hopping worlds, and that's tedious. You're basically spending a bunch of your time waiting for the game to load into a new world. That's no fun. But do you know what is fun? Quests. So we're going to do some quests that give us thieving XP. The Chosen Commander gives 20,000 thieving XP. So, even though it's not technically efficient, we're going to do a bunch of quests leading up to that quest so we can save ourselves 10 minutes picking these stupid doors. I think a good place to stop with thieving and getting into the questing would be around 60 thieving. So we grabbed ourselves 60 thieving and wrote up an itinerary so we can go and finish the Chosen Commander. It's time to return underground. But first we have to go and help our dwarf friends in Keldegrim. Don't forget to do your caches. We ruined a dwarven heritage site, but we told them to put a pin in it and we'll come back later to help them out. Well, it's later now, and we have to do this quest so we can do some goblin quests, because they intertwine. I miss the days when quests required you to use telekinetic grab. We have telekinesis in this game, but it never really gets used much. This guy also has a cat protecting his stuff. I really want to pet it. I'm gonna, I got, I gotta go pet it. I joined Purple Pewter because it was the closest one to the stairs, but actually I should have joined the yellow dwarven company. They only allow females, but this is a female avatar and they're closer to the stairs that goes to the ore bank. So I should have joined them, but I didn't. If you're speedrunning this quest in the future, be a female character and join the yellow... whatever the name of their group is. I, I, I don't know what it is. So that quest is done, and I remember in an earlier episode I said that I wasn't sure which came first, Dorgish Khan or Keldegrim. Turns out it was Keldegrim. Keldegrim was much older. We move on to another slice of ham. The Giant Dwarf is a prerequisite for this quest, because this is the quest that introduces the tram between Keldegrim and Dorgish Khan. These quests remind me of the caveman-only old-school Iron Man 
series that I haven't seen much from lately. I wonder what's going on with that. Maybe I just missed a video. Tying a person to railroad tracks is pretty villainous. But frankly, in these games, we're all murder hobos. So if somebody said they'd give me, you know, an XP lamp, I'd, 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 tie, I'd tie Zanuck to the railroad tracks if it meant I'd get a reward for it. Mining and prayer XP, that's okay. But hey, we can travel between Dorgish Khan and Keldegrim via the train. We're going to use this so much. You have no idea how useful this form of transportation is. It's my favorite means of getting around the game. So after setting up the train that we're never going to use, we move on to Land of the Goblins. I think this was one of the first quests that introduced Bandos as his own character instead of just calling him the Big High War God. But speaking of war, there was a goblin raid north of the crafting guild, so I thought, hey, why don't we kill Hollowtooth and see what he drops for us? No surprise, it really wasn't much, but you can get some really good armor drops from these guys, which for some reason sell for 25 mil. I think they're the best power armor in free-to-play, so they're pretty expensive. The interesting thing though is if you talk to the dwarves who show up after you kill all the goblins, they'll give you some rewards depending on where the goblin raid was. In this case we got some logs. It's actually quite a decent amount of logs, so if you're an Iron Man and you need some logs, there you go. This is the game's first depiction of Ubiusk, at least I believe so. This is unfortunately the way it looked after Bandos arrived and kind of wrecked up the place, but this was the homeland of the goblins, ogres, orcs, and orgs, and Bandos showed up and brought them to Gelenor because they were at least to him, creatures he could get to fight in his wars. Bandos loved war so much he was the only survivor of his race because he killed them all. You learn a lot about Bandos in the quest The Mighty Fall and also in the archaeology dig site The Warforge. There are criticisms to lay against the archaeology skill, but I do have to commend Jagex for really elaborating on a lot of the lore with the skill. And if any skill we're going to do it, it should be archaeology. So Xanak is stuck in a box, but we get the XP for completing the quest anyway. Some of the XP we get is thieving XP, but that's not the bulk of the XP we're going to get from these quests. It comes from the next quest, the Chosen Commander. Although this quest was released in 2009, the server image that Old School used when it was first released actually has some data for this quest because this quest was in development at that time. So they could actually add the Chosen Commander into Old School if they wanted to, they just need to finish it. And it wasn't until 2014, after the second world event where Armadillo killed Bandos, that the follow-up to this quest would be released. So we were stuck waiting five years, and then we got the really creepy motto for Xanak. We fight Sigmund once again, but because Xanak ain't messing around, she chops his hand off so he can't use the Ring of Life, and then stabs him right in the gut. I commend her for this action. She's got quite the go get him attitude. This part of the quest, the part right before the climax, right before the final boss, is actually kind of sad. If you don't spacebar through all the dialogue and you read what they have to say, these goblins are basically convinced that their entire civilization is going to get wiped out and just reduced to nothing by Bandos. They're so scared of Bandos, for good reason, that they believe they're all going to die. So you have to create a time capsule, bury it somewhere so people remember who they are. Then you have to talk to the ambassador from Keldegrim to help bring refugees from Dorgesh Khan to Keldegrim, specifically orphans, but the, the ambassador says no because he, he sucks. Then you have to lie to the orphans and tell them nothing's wrong, and then they just go off and play being wistful, carefree, and ignorant that death is knocking on their door. Their tiny little child doors. I am glad Bandos was killed. Birdman. He wins. The final fight is super easy because everything is weak to magic. I have nothing more to say about it. Now here's what we did all these quests for. We got ourselves 20,000 thieving XP, so now we don't have to do any more of that thieving. The agility XP is also nice, because agility is also a garbage skill to train. I have a bunch of footage of clue scrolls, but I can't remember where I got them. Now the fortune component, though. Hooray! I want to start doing some Slayer, but I don't want to get points until I can get the maximum number of points I can get. Which means I have to do smoking kills to get a boost to the points. And to do smoking kills, we have to do Eclaren's little helper first. Every time I do this quest, I dread this part. Here's hoping we make it on the first jump. Uh, what's, what's going on? What's happening? What, I... Uh, oh, uh, whoa. Oh, okay, we made it. Okay, cool. Hey, it's that dog friend. I remember him. But he doesn't remember us because the quest where we met him took place in the future. It's a sixth age quest, and this is a fifth age quest, and Jagex didn't want to lock sixth age quests behind fifth age quests for some god-awful reason. They, they, they should have had the requirements be in place. You shouldn't be able to do previous quests after 
future quests. It's stupid. Smoke and Kills introduced the Slayer helmet and combined Slayer gear back in 2008, and you originally had to do this quest before you can gain any points at all. They changed that though, and now it just increases the number of points you get. If you bring a rope, you can tie it to this rock here and create a shortcut, which will be useful for later quests. I believe dealing with Scabaris is one of them. This fight actually gave me a little bit of trouble. I, I had to eat quite a bit because I was just taking a lot of damage. Mostly the issue was accuracy. Unsurprisingly, most of the frustrations in this game is due to accuracy and dice rolls. No matter. We defeat the Banshee and complete the quest. I was getting tired of forgetting to bring my Draymond staff to Fairy Rings every time I wanted to teleport. So we're going to do Fairy Tale Part 3, Battle at Orcs Rift, which makes it so we no longer need the Draymond staff to use the Fairy Rings. While you're here during the quest, make sure you bring some planks and nails so you can fix this bridge and create a faster way of getting to Mostly Armless. Of course, you have the Book of Piracy now, which can teleport you all around the island, but this is a Master Quest Cape requirement, I believe, so you might as well get it done while you're here. With 85 fire making, you can light that bonfire and get 10,000 XP. The Enchanted Valley makes me feel oddly nostalgic for the Trailblazer League in Old School, which finished up only a few months ago. Lots of people were here killing tree spirits because they drop rune axes. That has nothing to do with this quest, I just thought I'd share. I'm looking forward to the next league. They're very fun. When they increased farming to 120, they added mango seeds, but mangoes were already in the game. While you're here, make sure you unblock the log. If you're a ninja monkey, you can squeeze through it. Okay, it's time that we fight a glaring stereotype. I know he's supposed to be based on the Godfather. You know, he's the fairy Godfather. He's a mafia boss, but they, they, really, they, they really went pretty strong with the accent in his dialogue boxes. I don't know, I guess it was a different time. So the hardest part about this fight was, again, accuracy. But once we finally killed all three of those orcs and all of the little minions, taking out the godfather was easy. This reminds me of Yogg Saron from World of Warcraft. The only thing that would make this creepier, though, is if it had a bunch of teeth. Frankly, if you add teeth to most things, they would become much creepier. My life has never been the same since I learned what a teratoma is. Hmm. Well, anyway, we finished the quest. Let's move on. When Jagex removed mobilizing armies quite a while ago, they wanted to make sure that a lot of the rewards stayed in the game. So there are various ways of imbuing rings throughout the game. But there were these things called locators, which I had never used, not even on my main. You make them using divine energy and a divine location. These locators come in tiers that are basically dependent on the type of divine location you use and the level of the energy. Basically, they teleport you around the game to different resources. So I decided to test it out, and I can even teleport you to Herblore ingredients. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. Iron Man must love these things. The problem is it teleports you randomly. For the secondary ingredients, it shows toad legs and white berries. So I thought maybe it would teleport me to white berries. But it doesn't. It just teleports you somewhere randomly. It teleports you to a random location with Herblore ingredients. Now, the other things you could teleport to are more specific. You could choose to teleport to u logs, or you can choose to teleport to lobsters. The problem is the teleport location is still random. So yes, it will teleport you to u logs, but you have no idea where those u logs are going to be. It will teleport you to a specific fishing spot, but you have no idea where that fishing spot will be. This one happens to be outside of Castle Wars. So locators aren't that great. You might think, oh, maybe it just needs to be a better locator or a higher level locator. The thing about higher level locators is that they just give you more places to teleport to. As far as I'm aware, it doesn't increase your agency. It just presents more options. I wouldn't go after these if I were you. But once you make it, you just have to recharge it with energy. You don't have to recreate the divine skilling locations. They have a maximum of 50 charges, and I believe it's three energy per charge to recharge. So if it's something that you'd be interested in, give it a try. I frankly will never use it again. In our explorations and our scaling, we were able to complete the statue of Damarok for the first time. If you're unaware what this is, there are strange rocks you can collect from various different skills. There's two for each skill. Although not every skill has a strange rock, I believe it's 15 skills, giving you a total of 30 rocks. Once per week, you can collect all 30 of these rocks and add it to the statue of Damarok. Every time you finish the statue, you get a replica statue piece. Every two weeks, you'll have two pieces and you can add them to the statue in your house. Once you've added all 30 rock pieces to your statue, you'll have a permanent statue of Damarok in your own house. 
This is a trimmed completionist requirement and takes a long time. A lot of people hate it. And we're back to lockpicking. This entire video was doing quests and building up to this moment. This critical moment where we finally unlock uh -huh, the ability to do safe cracking throughout Galenor. We needed 62 thieving and we're about to get it right now. Isn't that great? 62 thieving means we can now unlock Mistlin safes. But first we're going to do the final mini quest for the Thieves Guild. It's a really short one that involves making a potion and then stealing a thing. Who'd have thought you'd be stealing things? We get some Herbler XP and a lot of Thieving XP, which would have been nice at level 61, but we couldn't do this quest until we got to level 62. It's time for us to get started safe cracking. Now there are three safes in Varrock right next to each other, but you can't get in there until level 65 Thieving because there's a locked door and you need 65 Thieving to pick it. Fortunately, going from 62 to 65 is very fast when you can pick the saves in Lumbridge, in Draenor Manor, and in the Wizard's Tower. It goes by super fast. We were nearing reset at the time of the recording of this footage, so I stopped picking saves, I stopped being a thief, and I went to Herby Werby because it provides a pretty good amount of Herbler XP. Also, I want to make sure I get enough points so I can eventually buy the Herb Bag from this minigame. Much like the Herb Bag in old school can only hold grimy herbs. However, the herbs automatically go into the bag if you pick them up. For 200 Herby Werby points, you can get the default bag, which holds up to 50 of each grimy herb. And for another 200 points, you can upgrade it, so it holds 100 of each grimy herb. After this round of Herby Werby, I'm going to get back to safe cracking. At the time, when I was doing Herby Werby, I didn't know how much safe cracking I was going to do after I was done. But now, since I'm recording this in the future, I know exactly how much safe cracking I did. But that's a mystery that won't be revealed until next time on How Fast to Max. Thank you for watching. Take care.